Hi, thanks for joining us for The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. The correct soil pH is very important to plant growth. Today we're going to show how to correct bad pH. Also, don't go pulling out those chemicals every time you see a problem. You may not need to do anything at all. That's just ahead on The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Mr. D. Mr. D is a retired UT Extension Director, and Amy Dismutes will be joining me later. Hi, right, Mr. D. We always tell people to get their soil tested, right? Because right. soil pH is all about nutrient availability. But what if they have to lower or raise their pH? How does that happen? We have products that can do that. <laughs> okay, yeah, we got products that can do that. So let's talk about lime first then. Okay. Don't guess soil tests. Yes. I'm going to repeat that. Yes. Don't guess soil tests. That's a phrase that Extension Services has mm -hmm. been using for years and years and years. But to raise pH, and that's primary the primary problem, most plants, most vegetables, most fruits need a relatively high pH, mm -hmm. between 5.8 and 6.2. Mm -hmm. Seven is neutral. Right. So that's what you're striving for, you know, six, six and a half even yeah, six and uh, a half is, is, a, is a good pH. Because yeah. that's the range where a lot of your nutrients are available to the plant. For muta grass, most lawn yeah. grasses, uh, uh, most vegetables and most fruits, that's yeah. what you strive for. Exactly. And when you get your soil tested, I'm using the UT Extension oh, soil yeah. test report, when you get it tested you'll get a report like this back and when you get the results back you see this and you go oh my gosh what, <laughs> now what do I do and on the back it tells you exactly what to do. Now for example if you are in a situation that a lot of, I find a lot of homeowners are in and your pH is down around 5.2 or 5.5 mm -hmm. you need to raise your pH because you have ornamentals, you yeah. have uh, 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 vegetables, Vegetable or fruits, bar. or whatever, right. yeah. uh, the instructions will tell you how many pounds of lime to add mm -hmm. per thousand square feet. That is that good. Mm -hmm. So in it, an example, if you need to raise the pH from, uh, and I'm, this is strictly an example, from, from say 5.8 to 6.2, uh, you may need to add 50 pounds of lime per thousand square feet. Okay. So it's very important that you know how much, just how much square footage you are 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 dealing with. Sure. You know, sure. length time width equals area. That's yeah, right. You know, and so you figure that out, <laughs> and you know how much lime to put out. There's several different kinds of lime. You can get agricultural ground limestone. You can get calcitic limestone. You can get dolomitic limestone. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can get pelletized this, yeah. limestone. This is an example of mm -hmm. pelletized. Pelletized lime is really easy to put out because it will go out through your fertilizer spreader. Okay. Your push spreader is really uniform and it does a really good job. Some of the agricultural ground and dolomitic and things, calcitic, some of that is really powdery, mm -hmm. very powdery. And the only way I know to put that out is with a corn scoop. Oh a my shovel. gosh. Right. And you just kind of try to scatter yeah. it out as evenly as you can. Right. Uh, yeah, this but is just good, just follow the instructions, do the math. Uh, if it says 50 pounds per thousand square feet, if you've got <laughs> 10,000 square feet to treat, it's 10 times 50. You need do 500 pounds. That's, That's right. a 50 pound 50 bag pounds, right yeah. here. Yep. So, uh, and th and that will do the trick for you. Yeah. Pretty easy to spread. Yeah, yeah it is. Mm -hmm. Now, if you need to lower the pH, right. and it, the, there are just a few examples of where you need a low pH, but they are very, very important. Uh, blueberries yeah. is the number one reason that you need a very low pH for blueberries. 4.8 to 5.2 is ideal, and I would lean toward the 4.8. Wow. I okay. used to say it needs to be almost acid enough to burn the soles off your boots. Oh my gosh, that's, that's It needs to be acidic. very, very acid for blueberries. <laughs> Azaleas are an example mm -hmm. of an ornamental that do better uh, in uh, acid soils. Camellias, Camellias also right. do better in, right. in, in acid soils. Right. But uh, uh, we are standing in a situation where our pH here is seven. It's neutral. 
these blueberries, as you can see, uh, <laughs> struggling. You know, they're 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 alive. This one yeah. has a pretty good crop of blueberries yeah, it on does. it. Yes, it does. And this one has no blueberries on it. This one looks healthier than this one. Mm -hmm. They're two different varieties. I believe this one is tip blue, and I believe this one is climax. climax. Right. But the main reason this one doesn't look as well as green as this one is because it's got a crop of blueberries on it. Yeah. Uh, but we need to raise, we need to lower the pH mm -hmm. from seven down to at least five and a half, or I, or at least four point nine, or something sure. like. That. It's got to get below five point two. We've got to get it below five point two for these blueberries to flourish. And uh, the way to do that. It tells me on the back, of, on the instructions, it says <laughs> the soil pH should be within the range of 4.8 to 5.5. I disagree with the 5.5. Oh, you disagree with that, all right. <laughs> it says if the pH is above this range, apply two tenths pound of elemental sulfur per 100 square feet. For each one tenth unit, the pH is above 5.2. Okay. Mm -hmm. I counted the number mm -hmm. of tenths between 5.2 and 7, seven. Mm -hmm. and I ended up with about 26 of them. So I need two tenths of a pound of elemental sulfur per tenth. Did the math. Bottom line is I need 5.2 pounds of elemental sulfur per 100 square feet. Per. That's what I need. Okay, I have done a little, I stepped this off, uh -huh. <laughs> and I, pl I think there's about 50 square feet around each of these blueberries, because those blueberry roots are going to go out as far as the soil is kind to them. And the mm. further they can go out, the more moisture they can get. Right. Right. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to spread that out a little bit. Okay. Uh, now, this is a common uh, acidifying product that you can find at a lot of uh, the local uh, lawn and garden centers around. Right. But this is not elemental sulfur. This is 30% sulfur. Okay. To get elemental sulfur, you're probably going to have to go to a farmer's co-op or something like that somewhere, agricultural that's used to, to, to selling to, to farmers. Uh, we can make this work since it's 30% uh, elemental sulfur is 90%, 90%, so we have to use three times as mm -hmm. much of this to get the amount of sulfur out here that we need to. Which can be done. Can well, be now, right. if we were using regular sulfur, regular sulfur is white. You, this has, you'll see some of that as yeah. I'm putting this out. Uh, I would say it's going to look like it snowed out here. We've got to put <laughs> that much out. So, with that being said, are you ready for me to go I'm in ready. and uh, ready let's, let's the, start trying to improve? Demo. We're going to try to improve the environment for these blueberries. Yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. My target is uh, 2.6 pounds per plant of elemental mm -hmm. sulfur. This is a six pound bag. I'm going to put it all out. I'll put it each, all out. Each of these plants is going to get a bag. So a bag of plant. That's okay. right. All right. See the sulfur blowing? Yeah. Okay, the Bermuda grass may discolor a little bit because it doesn't really like acid soils. So how long do you think before we start to see any changes in the pH? N not tomorrow. <laughs> not uh, tomorrow. pH changes do not happen overnight. Okay. Uh, so if you've got a problem, the sooner you can treat, the better. Some of this pH change won't occur, you know, till next year. But these improved acidifiers or time release. Some of them will be released earlier than, than others. And, uh, you know, you don't want a drastic change and then to start going the other way immediately. Right. You only should have to do this. Actually, once you get the pH low, as long as you don't add lime to it, it should stay down. Stay down. With uh, liming and raising pH, you may have to do that every four or five years. Mm -hmm. But there's really no need to soil test every year. Right. I would soil test every two or three years, mm -hmm. and and uh, every three or four years even. And and, and oh, that sounds good. Uh, you'll so let me ask you this: Should one water water that in, or you can? Uh, it would. It'll probably make it start to work okay. quicker. Uh, don't water it to the point where uh, 
it'll run off. You don't okay. want to wash any of it away. You want all it all right. to go down into the root system. All right, Mr. D, as always, we appreciate the demonstration, so we'll let you get to that other blueberry plant over there. Okay, good deal. It seems that there's an aphid species for every plant species that is out there. This is our tomato plant, and as you can see here, it has aphids. Aphids have piercing, sucky mouth parts. They love plant sap. This can actually weaken the plant. So here's what you can do. Instead of pulling out the harsh chemicals, you can use low impact chemicals. So I would suggest something like insecticidal soap. Make sure you read and follow the label on that. And neem oil. Uh, you don't want to spray any of these pesticides during the heat of the day. But again, read and follow the label. If you decide not to use any of the low impact pesticides, don't fear. Lady beetle larvas love to eat aphids. So if you see those beneficials on your tomato plants or any of your plants for that matter, just let the beneficials do their job. They will control those aphids for you. All right, Amy, let's talk about landscape insects. And let's first start with what is IPM? We hear that term all the time. Yeah, that's a big fancy word yeah. basically. And it means integrated pest management. Mm -hmm. And the goal behind IPM is to not focus just on the chemical control uh -huh. method, but it's to utilize the other methods of control because right. often chemical control may not be needed. Okay. So basically what we want to do with IPM is we are going to first determine what's going on, number one. Okay, that's number one. Um, specifically with insects. So that would be the ability to be able to recognize insect damage from other disease or potentially human error mm -hmm. or animal. Um, my dog has flattened several grasses as of late and I was trying to figure out what was going on and now I know. Okay. But, so recognizing what type of damage we might actually have going on first. Okay. And then when we move into the insect world, um, of course it's obviously become very important with our pollinators. Sure. Sure. Pollinators are on the news right now, mm -hmm. and many times we don't actually need to take control measures. So with that IPM, we have cultural controls, and that can be anything from keeping the weeds down, mm -hmm. because insects also harbor in weeds. That's right. Um, weeds also compete for nutrients with your plants that weaken your plants, mm -hmm. and therefore sometimes make insect infestation a little more feasible. Okay. We always talk about plants are like people, sure. and the weaker the weaker the person, the more susceptible we are to issues. And same That's thing with the plants. Such a good point. So, um, and then of course we have mechanical, which would be anything from pruning, proper mm -hmm. pruning, uh -huh. to remove, let's say, um, a branch that may have insect eggs overwintering on it. Mm -hmm. um, maybe maybe just a little bit of diseased or destroyed tissue that may have some damage that we need to go ahead and get off. And then sanitizing the area to get up all of that um, possibly dropped leaf litter that may have overwintering eggs on it as well. That's right. And then we also have what we call the biologicals. Uh -huh. And this is where it gets kind of fancy and scientific. <laughs> um, now folks always like to ask about, well, I'm gonna go buy ladybugs to put out in my yard. And here's the kicker. If you don't have a food source for the ladybugs, guess what happens to them? They're gonna leave. They're gonna leave. So, mm -hmm. what I usually tell folks is why don't we start to look around and let's first see what type of beneficials we're noticing. Because okay. often, if we don't have a major infestation yet and we have beneficials present, they're gonna do the job for us. That's right. So, give them a chance. And that's pretty much where we move into developing or deciding if we need a chemical spray. It's determining our threshold of activity. Right. And that needs to be the last thing that we the discuss. Last right? The thing. last thing. Yeah. Right. And even then, you don't have to go hard <laughs> core. Right. Right. You know, we have these oil sprays. We mm -hmm. have insecticidal soaps. Mm -hmm. um, we have what I call the good old coffee cup with water and a squirt of soap in there yeah. for Japanese yep. beetles, boom, 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 right. boom, boom, right. boom. <laughs> and it works just great. It sure does. So um, that would be the last approach, would be the chemical approach, is okay. to where Good. we determine what type of insect we actually have occurring okay. before we jump in. I call that know before you go. Know before you go. Yeah. Okay. Now what else do we need to know about plant material? 
well, more insects. With what's really, really important, and that kind of gets into it, and any extension agent can talk to you about it, or master gardeners, mm -hmm. but there's different insect damage caused by different insects. Sure. And sometimes it can get a little bit confusing. And I did bring some trick samples here. Oh yeah, these are good samples. You know, we were talking about it before, and I'd say when we see holes in the leaves, we have many different things that can cause holes in the leaves. Now this right here, to be quite honest with you, I'm infatuated with this. <laughs> I think this is phenomenal, and I, I wish I, I had a plant that looked like right. this. But we had a sample come in a couple of weeks ago in Williamson County, and they wanted to spray. This is just a small native leaf cutter bee that does not sting. Mm -hmm. It's not damaging the plant. It just takes a beautiful little perfect circle and it'll use it to make nesting. Mm. So this is not something we would actually treat for. Right. Whereas if you didn't know, you might pull out that insecticide and yeah. start spraying blindly. Sure would. Now another one that I brought that that is very interesting to me often. And a good one. Yeah. This is a great one, yes. and we get this all the all time. The time. <laughs> this is where it becomes really specific to know that host plant you're dealing with. This is actually not insect damage. Mm. Right now, we're looking at a bacterial pathogen on laurel. We know the host. We know what this damage looks like on That's laurel. Right. We don't spray. That's right. Good. So Good. it gets just a little bit tricky sometimes, but then there are other instances, let's say, um, and we're gonna use this piece as a nice example. We've got holes. These are getting to be rather large holes, okay? <laughs> this is probably a little weathering, but when we flip it over to the other side. The telltale sign. How about that? What we have are some carpenter bees. Now, I'm gonna tell you guys another trick as well. You hear about spraying for carpenter bees or pushing a little insecticide uh -huh. down in the hole. I've heard that. Number one, don't <laughs> caulk the hole. Uh, right. My mother will kill me for saying this. <laughs> but a lot I of people came do home, it. Yeah. She caulks the holes and the bee is he's gonna come back out. Right. <laughs> so you now have two holes versus one. Uh -huh. <laughs> but um, this is actually a shed from a piece of a shed that fell down because of carpenter to be destruction. Fell down. It fell down. It collapsed completely because the entire structure was covered in wow. these guys and a nice heavy wind came along and it crumpled to the ground. Impressive. Now, folks want to spray for this. Sure. Another story I'll give real quick. Um, Dad used to impress us kids. <laughs> Anybody knows about carpenter bees knows that the males don't actually sting. Right. So my dad was the superhero who used to kill <laughs> carpenter bees with his hands okay. when we were little. <laughs> so if you get brave and you want to go about that way, you're welcome to do that. But we also have some perimeter sprays or barricades where we basically treat okay. or seal the wood. Um, and then again, we have carpenter bee traps now. Yes, and they are actually those. pretty effective, I have mm -hmm. to say. So, and we have time for a few more. Yeah, well, this is another really big one yeah. on the, uh, let's say, Leland Cypress, Arbovita, any of those evergreens. Probably the only evergreen that I have not seen this guy on, I'd say, is pine trees. Hmm. But we often get calls. I know you get them too. <sighs> My evergreen tree is browning, it's turning brown. It's turning brown, I don't know what's going on. It's very gradual, mm -hmm. not immediately. But it looks like it's bronze, then it gets a nice sheen to it, and then the entire branch browns out. Mm -hmm. Well, this is a tricky one. This guy is actually called the spruce spider mite. Well, we immediately wanna to try to treat for this, sure right? We do. <laughs> well, here's the sure. kicker. The spruce spider mite's not active in the summertime. We're only active in the fall Lex or winter. cooler weather. Right. right, so this would be an example of something that we would actually wait, and we would wait and treat in the fall because the insect is not present. Hmm. So there is no need. We are spraying for no reason. Yeah. And I don't know about you, but I know I don't like to waste my time or my money. Amy, it's <laughs> good stuff. We appreciate yeah. that. Yes, sir. All right. We can see that our sweet corn here clearly needs some attention. This was all planted at the same time, it's the same variety, but obviously this sweet corn 
got a little boost probably when the lawn folks came by and fertilized this Bermuda grass. A routine side dressing is necessary for non-leguminous plants. Uh, rule of thumb amount of nitrogen is about a half a pound of actual nitrogen per 100 foot of row. Uh, we've got 25 foot of row here. Uh, we're putting out 3400 so I, I need about six ounces of 3400 to get the amount of actual in out here that I need and I'm going to do that. I'm going to try to spread this out just as evenly as I can. I don't want to run out. I would rather have to come over it twice. It should change the color of these corn plants pretty quickly. With sweet corn, one side dressing is all you need. Commercial farmers, when the corn gets about 14 inches tall, they go in there and they will side dress and they're done. All right, Mr. D, this is our Q&A session. Let's do it. A lot of good questions here. Yeah. All right, here's our first viewer email. <laughs> I like this one. <laughs> Chris, help. I know you get this question several times a year, and usually in May and September, but we had moles blowing up our yard in January and February this year, and without touching the yards on either side of us. And we have had our longtime local lawn maintenance company put down chemicals in the spring and fall to control, eliminate them. What can we do to get moles out of our yard? And who can we call? Ghostbusters? <laughs> <laughs> Doug what? and Gigi, It'd Bartlett, be... Tennessee, Ghostbusters, right? No, it'd be Mole Busters. No, Mole Busters, right? Mole Busters. Right. <laughs> you know, oh uh, gosh, this tells it's the me question. It's the mole question, right? This tells me that Doug and Gigi <laughs> have good organic matter uh -huh. in their soil. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh, they have lots of earthworms, uh -huh. and I'll moles love earthworms. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> They just need to get in touch with their hunter instinct, <laughs> buy a good scissors type mole trap right. <laughs> and find a long tunnel okay. and set that trap over that long tunnel and try to catch them. One mole can tunnel over 200 feet in one night. That's a lot. So they think That's they've a got a lot of moles. Probably no, right. you may have one or two. So why the long tunnel though? So the long tunnel is probably a transportation okay. tunnel. Right. If you just put your trap over a little small tunnel, that's a feeding tunnel okay. probably. So the mole will tunnel over here and grab a worm, and then he'll tunnel over here and grab a worm. Right. He may not ever go back to those little short tunnels. Okay. But if you can find a long tunnel, um, four or five foot long, okay. uh, that, then he's probably, uh, uh, that might be a transportation tunnel. Leave it there for a couple of nights, a couple of days, and if it doesn't catch anything, move it yeah, somewhere move it else. There. Just move it, and, and I guarantee you, you'll catch him. Yeah. And uh, if you use a good trap, now, I've not had any luck with the spear type traps. Okay, those harpoon? Uh, the harpoon, yeah, the harpoon I've not trap. had any luck with those. Uh, I've tried them, and I, I've, with the scissors tight, I'm, I'm talking about, uh, I probably catch 14 or 15 moles a year. Oh, okay. In my, and I live out in the woods, <laughs> right, you know, and right. so I'll catch one and I'm okay for two or three weeks right. and another one will come. And, and I catch them. So and, they, and I catch the trap them. works. The trap yeah, works. You, yeah, you get a trap works. trap works. But, but uh, mole uh, poison yeah. peanuts, yeah. Get baits and things like yeah. that. You know, moles are carnivorous. They like nice, juicy earthworms. <laughs> so why would one want to eat a poison peanut? Right. You know, that, that just blows my mind. Right. You know, I, I'm, 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 I'm the, thinking the mole's going to see that poison peanut and he's going to go around it and go find him a mole. Right. Uh, I mean, an a earthworm. But uh, uh, trap them. Yeah. Trap them. Yeah. All right, Doug and Gigi. <laughs> <laughs> scissor trap, right? We know the scissor trap does work. Mm. Thank you for the question. Mole busters. Mole busters. Call mole busters. Mole busters. <laughs> Maybe that's what I need to do when I retire. Yeah, mole busters. <laughs> <laughs> trap moles. All right, here's our next viewer email. I have ants eating the blossoms of my yellow crooked neck squash. What do I do about ants? I have hand pollinated, but the squash are small and falling off. Please help me. I have worked so hard this year to do better than last year. And this is Idy from Port St. Joe, Florida on YouTube. Ants eating the blossoms, but, but, but here's something too, all right, that we should take into consideration. But the squash is still small and falling off. 
even after hand pollinating. So that tells me something about pollination there. Right. I've never seen an ant eat a squash. You know, ants are generally beneficial in yes. your garden. Now, they're going to be around if you have aphids. Sure, sure. And uh, because aphids secrete honeydew and the ants like that. Oh, they like and, uh, yeah. But uh, the ants aren't the problem. Uh, what do you think? You think uh, uh, the squash didn't get pollinated, or I, yeah, or do you think? I don't think it got adequately pollinated. Yeah, right. even though she tried to hand pollinate, if you're trying to hand pollinate a male blossom with a male blossom, it's probably not going to work. <laughs> it's not going to work, you know? right? That's uh, not going to work. And sometimes you only have male blossoms on the plant, for and a that while. does happen. It yeah, does happen. and and I can understand that being confusing. Yeah, but, that uh, does happen because the male blossoms actually appear first. Mm -hmm. Then you will get the females, but you'll know the difference between the male and the female because the female will have a little ovary that mm -hmm. looks like a. Squash, right? You know, under the petal. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, I'm thinking inadequate pollination. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. you got to make sure that you, you know, go back and forth with the male and the female. Yeah. Uh, and then of course environmental conditions and maybe some stresses there. But I just think it's pollination. Yeah. You know, yeah. maybe you don't have any bee activity. You know, maybe, but you can still, you know, hand pollinate. But right. you got to make sure you got the male and the female to do that. Yeah. That's right. Right. Because again, yeah. I mean, yeah, if they're small and falling off, then that's the problem. Biology. Right. Good old-fashioned biology, yeah. biology ID. So we thank you for that question. Mr. D, that was fun. That was yep. fun. Thank you yeah. much. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplots at wkno.org, and the mailing address is familyplots 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for joining us. If you want to learn more about soil pH or integrated pest management, head on over to familyplotgarden.com. We have information on all the topics we talked about today and many others. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.